The clerk. Government business. Order of the day. Research involving embryos and prohibition of human cloning bill 2002. Resumption of debate on second reading. Question is that this bill be now read a second time. The honourable member for Perth. I move that further proceedings be conducted in the House. The question is that the House do now adjourn. All of the question, please say aye to the contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. The noes have it. Any objection? You've uh, resolved, have you, Mr Speaker, I've resolved. That, that the proceedings not be further conducted in the House? Yes. Okay. In that case, I move to dissent from uh, your ruling. And I move to dissent from your ruling because it is incapable of the main committee to pass such a resolution. Uh, the basis on which the resolution, or the basis on which this bill was sent to uh, this House, this committee, sorry, by the uh, House. Uh, is contrary to standing orders, uh, and uh, on that basis, uh, the House can, this committee can do nothing other than refer the bill back to the uh, to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. No, the rule. That the question is that the uh, that the uh, honourable member of Perth moves dissent. My my ruling on it would be that uh, under the standing orders of the of the main committee. If there is a disagreement over a division in this house, then it is set aside and uh, dealt with at the in the house. There's been no disagreement over, as I understand, there's been no disagreement over a resolution. I move that further proceedings be conducted in the house. You called that, that had been defeated, despite the fact there were three on this side supporting that and one on the other, two on the other side. There was no dissenting voice from that, so the question of an unresolved question does not arise. The committee, having passed that resolution that the house not that the that the bill not be returned to the house, I've taken a point of order, and the point of order is that the committee is not capable of resolving in that way because the basis on which the bill was sent to this committee is outside the standing orders. That's the point of order I've taken. The standing orders of this main committee are that you cannot resolve an issue in this committee. I therefore rule the question is unresolved. And the matter will be referred to the House. However, in accordance with the resolution agreed to by the House earlier today, debate on the bill will continue regardless of any unresolved question. So, I call the honourable member for Wentworth. Point of order, member for Perth. Do, do, I, do I now understand that what you're ruling is that my motion to return the matter to the House so that further proceedings be conducted in the House? Having uh, Deb, you having ruled, you've now ruled that, that was an unresolved question. What I'm ruling is that the standing orders say that a question cannot be resolved in the committee; it must be referred to the House. I'm, I'm ordering that this is an unresolved question and will be referred to the well, House. Well, my point of order is it's not an unresolved question. If you look at Standing Order 276, every question in the committee shall be decided on the voices, and if any member dissents from the result announced by the chair, the question shall be recorded in the minutes as unresolved. No, right. mem no, mem correct. no member dissented. That is, that is exactly what I've ruled. No member, but no member dissented. It, it's unresolved, so it will be decided by the House because this House cannot resolve a question. Yeah, but the point is, this is my point of order. How a question is decided? Division not possible. Standing Order 276. Every question in the committee shall be decided on the voices, and if any member dissents from the result announced by the chair, the question shall be recorded in the minutes as unresolved. No member dissented from the result announced by the chair. The, I, matter was, the matter was resolved. I ruled that it, be, it was in the negative. I ruled that it was in the negative. And no there, there's no point of order. There's no point of order. I call the honourable member for Wentworth. You, you're ruling, as I understand it, that my motion that further proceedings be conducted be in, the House in the House is an unresolved question. It will be resolved in the House. I call I, the honourable member for Wentworth. I, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move dissent from your ruling. Yeah. The question is that, the, that my ruling be dissented to. All of that opinion, please say aye. To the contrary, no. no. And those have it. The question, I ask for the ayes. I didn't hear any. Uh, the, the, the question is unresolved, so I will refer it to the House. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. I ask for all those in favour. There were none. You ruled, it, you ruled that my dissent was not carried, and I called the I, I called dissent to that. No I called it. Order. Order. I called it. There's no point of order. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. Thank you. Point of, member for Wentworth. point of order. Perth on a point of order. 
I moved dissent from your ruling. That was put. You ruled that it wasn't carried. I, I raised my voice in accordance with Standing Order 276 and indicated that it was an unresolved question. And I accommodated you by saying it will be referred to the House. No, but it needs to be referred to the House now. Under standing or, on the combination of Standing Order 270 and 276, a dissent from your ruling has to be referred to the House now. It is a dissent from your ruling. It is not covered in any way by the resolution of the House in respect of the bill the House is dealing with, which, which, which deems that any unresolved issue be treated order, as a resolved please, question. Order, order, please. I remind the member for Perth of the resolution agreed to by the House before the, the uh, dinner, dinner yep. was, uh, the adjournment was called, and point four of that says the main committee continuing debate on the bill regardless of any unresolved questions. Yep. The main committee continuing debate on the bill regardless of any unresolved question. This is, not, this, is not, unresolved this is not on the bill. This is a dissent from your ruling. No, that is, this is an unresolved I, question on a ruling made by you. I, uh, it is not covered by the resolution is, passed by the House. As far as I'm concerned, it is. There is no point of order. The Honourable well, Member for Wentworth. Point, point of order, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, you haven't sat down yet. Well, I'll sit down. Point of order. I have a point of order. A member for Perth on a point of order. In accordance with Standing Order 270 and Standing Order 276, if one voice is raised in dissent from a, from a, from a chair's ruling, the matter is unresolved and returned to the House immediately. They're the standing orders. The resolution passed by the House prior to, uh, prior to uh, dinner does not cover a dissent, does not cover a ruling of the chair, does not cover a motion of dissent to your ruling. It only deals with the bill. Your ruling has been challenged. That is an unresolved question. It must be referred to the House now. Whether it be a ruling on a point of order or whether it be a ruling on dissent, I consider it, it is a ruling. And the fact is that under the, under the uh, uh, orders that were resolved in the House, which says the main committee continued to debate the bill regardless of any res unresolved questions. This is an unresolved question. I will refer it to the House. Speaker, it, needs to, for Perth. it needs to be referred to the House now. because It does not, not have to be referred to the, the House now. Well, in that case, Mr Deputy, Deputy Speaker, I move that the main committee has no confidence in the chair. Well, the question is that the main committee has no confidence in the chair. All that opinion, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. no. Okay. It is an unresolved question. I will refer it to the House. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. Mr Deputy Speaker, the issue before the House... I said it is an unresolved question. Will we... I heard the eyes and I heard the nose and I ruled that the no and I ruled that the nose have it. On a point of order, the member for Perth. My point of order is this: there is an unresolved question in respect of the confidence that the main committee has in, in the chair. Do you want to move another motion? I, I've moved the motion. I've, that, I've said the motion has been negated. I've referred it to the, to the house. It needs to be. The, I move that that matter be, be, be referred by the main committee to the House immediately. The question is that it be referred to the House immediately. All that opinion, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I, I believe the noes have it. It's an unresolved question. I'll refer it to the House. I'll call the honourable member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The issues before this House are complex and are of long-term The member for Wentworth will resume his seat. The member for Perth it's on it's a point of order. There, there are three unresolved questions. I have referred Firstly, them to there the is House a dissent. to be Secondly, there is a, want of a motion for a want of confidence in you. And thirdly, that that want of confidence be referred to the House forthwith. On what basis do you say that, does, that can't be referred to the House? The basis, it has to be referred to the House forthwith. On the basis of the motion that was moved earlier in the House the House's and carried resolution, by the House. The House's resolution doesn't say anything about want of confidence in the Chair. It says if there are unresolved questions, they will be referred to the in House. In respect That's of the I Bill, whether the committee has confidence in you or not has nothing to do with the Bill. The, 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 there are the no, House's there resolution, is, the, the the member House's for, resolution the doesn't member cover for it. The Member for Perth will resume his seat. The, the Member for, the will, the member for Perth will resume his seat. The member for Perth will resume his seat. The member for Gilmore on a point of order. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the member for Perth no longer be heard. The question is the member for Perth be no longer heard. All that opinion, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. But this is an unresolved question. The, I call the honourable member for Wentworth. The member for Perth on a point of order. Order, order. Member for Perth on a point of order. There are three unresolved questions, 
three unresolved questions, four. or four if you take if you four, four, four now I think. There and are they four will all be there resolved by the House. None of them are covered no. by the resolution passed by the House, which refer to the bill. There is an unresolved question in respect of dissent from your ruling. There's an unresolved question in respect of want of confidence in the chair. There's an unresolved question in respect of that want of confidence being referred to the House immediately. And there's an unresolved question in respect of whether the member for Perth be no longer heard. That's correct. And those, all those issues need to be referred to the House now because the House's resolution passed before you have, dinner you have another refers point of to order? debate on the bill. Do you have another point of order? You must act now. No, no. You I, have no you choice. Have, but you to have act another now. point of what I've ruled on all of those. The the uh, member for uh, Robertson on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is quite a, an outrageous performance by the opposition. It, it, it is just what a, is the, it is what, just what is a ploy, point of order? Mr. Deputy Speaker. I mean, the motion that was carried in the House is very very clear that the main committee continue debate on the bill regardless of any unresolved questions. Now, what we are trying to do as a government is to provide that, the facility for the government members. I've heard the point of order. I've we are trying to provide order. facility for government members uh, the member for to, and opposition resume. members to continue the debate Robinson on this bill. His seat. I've heard the point of order. I've ruled on that point of order. Speaker. The member for Lilly on a point of yes, order. Yes, my point of order is very precise, Mr Deputy Speaker. The motion provided by the House says following arrangements applying in relation to the research involving embryos and prohibition of human cloning bill 2002. It has nothing to do with the substantial procedural issues that the member for Perth has been raising and disagreeing with you on. So his point is valid that this should be returned to the House forthwith. I will remind the member for Lilly of point four and I will take him to the third last word which says any unresolved questions will be referred to the House. Order, Mr. Speaker, it is clearly subsidiary to the lead paragraph in the motion passed by the House. The lead paragraph rel relates only to research involving embryos and prohibition of human cloning. If the Parliament had wished this to extend to procedural There's matters no before this order, House, that would have been included issue. in the motion passed by no, the, the House. No point of order. You're, you're debating the issue. The honourable member for Wentworth. Mr. Speaker, the issues before this House are complex. The, the, sorry, the member for Wentworth will resume his seat. The honourable member for uh, Mr. Speaker, how can you Melbourne rule? Ports. How can you rule as you have that that dissents in the chair procedural matters, where a clear majority of people in the main committee dissent in your ruling, cannot is, is considered Order. Un, Order. under point four uh, of member for the, uh, has the floor. point four of the resolution that you're quoting as, as to not refer this back to the House. This is a clear abuse of the democratic process, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm sorry. This is, this, well, I'm, I'm not ashamed of our Ports, source because the, the, the majority Ports of will resume uh, in any chamber should be able to decide what the procedure The member for Melbourne Ports will resume his seat. I've heard his point of order. I've heard your point of order. Resume your seat. The, the, the standing orders say that this House cannot resolve a question. If a question is unresolved, it is referred to the to the main to the House, and we cannot resolve a question. I have referred the unresolved questions to the House. But I call the honourable member for Wentworth. The honourable member for Lee, member for Wentworth, the honourable member for Lilly, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, they clearly do not resolve. Do not go. Do you have a point of order? I certainly do. The What's motion the point of order? passed by by the House of Representatives earlier this evening Order, clearly does not go to the procedural matters that are currently being contested on the floor. As I've said to you before, one, two and three, the subsets of the overall motion uh, passed relate only to the bill. They do not Order, relate to no procedural matters. Order. Otherwise, the those, for Lilly rules, is debating those standing the orders... Mr Speaker, will you let me finish no, my standing order? No, the member for Lilly is debating the issue. I said there is no point of order. Well, you haven't heard me out yet. Well, I said I'm, there was no point of order. Are, you will resume your speak on that. Take the point of order. The point of order is very simple. There are, there are specific standing orders which relate to procedures which are not mentioned in the motion that has been passed by the House of Representatives earlier this evening. They are not mentioned at all, and therefore they are outside the ambit of your ruling, clearly outside the ambit of your ruling. Had the parliament wished to suspend procedural matters before the main committee, all of those existing procedures and the standing orders would have been mentioned in the motion that was passed by the House of Representatives only a couple of hours ago. I will say again that the principal issue involved here is that this House cannot resolve an issue. 
Even though the motions might be moved and, and, and ruled upon, this House cannot resolve that. It has to be referred to the House, the main House. I call the honourable member for Wentworth. And on a point of on a point of order, member. Point of order, Mr. Deputy What's Speaker? the point of order? You have already resolved those matters. In effect, this should no, be I referred to the House. The issues have been referred to the House for resolution. The honourable member for Wentworth. Speaker, the issues. The honourable member for, for Prospect. Yes, on Mr. A point Deputy of order. Speaker. I too raise on a point of order. I very clearly heard the honourable member for Perth raise a dissent in your ruling. That's why I came into this chamber. I would like to know on what ruling you can say the resolution that we voted on in the House dealing with one, two, three and four of the items had anything whatsoever to cover dissent in the Chair's ruling. I would like to know advice you have now taken from the, chair, from the clerk on how you can possibly say to the honourable member for Perth that his dissent in your ruling is now going to be covered at a further time in another chamber, where in this chamber at the moment, if dissent is taken against the Speaker in his ruling, then that has to be acted on now. Could the you please explain? Look, for the, uh, for the benefit of the honourable member for Prospect, the fourth point of the motion that was passed in the House says the main committee continuing debate on the bill regardless of any unresolved questions. We have four that have been referred to the House. The honourable member for Prospect, uh, my point of order. Uh, yes, further to that, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like it clearly explained to us in this chamber here, both sides, how condition four. Order very clearly spells out anything appertaining to the dissent in the Chair's ruling. We debated that in the House in another chamber. We took a vote on that in the chamber, and that was applicable to the bill before the House being sent to the main committee. During the course of the event of this bill coming to this main committee, a dissent was clearly taken in your ruling. And I would like to be advised how this chamber can keep operating with a chair when a motion has not been resolved in which dissent has been taken from the floor against the chairman's ruling. The honourable member for Prospect would realise that the motion was put and was unresolved and was referred to the House. So that, that is the standing orders of this committee. So I call the honourable member for Wentworth. I, the member for Lilly on a point of order. Well, if that's the case, we should adjourn to the House immediately. The member for Wentworth. Deputy Speaker, the issues before this House are complex. The member for no. Wentworth will resume. The member for Prospect on a point of order. I don't wish to take the honourable member's time. I'm sure he's only too willing to get forward to the debate as long as both sides of the House are. I would like it explained, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm sorry you have not explained it by referring me or any other member of the main committee to clause four of the motion put by the Leader of Government Business in the House. Clause four clearly refers to the bill that was referred from the chamber to the main committee. There was a clear motion put dissenting in your ruling. If that motion has been moved, put, it can't be carried in this House, then all debate must adjourn and it must be resolved in the parliament, in the main chamber. It is an unresolved in question for the bill. Order, in member for Prospect, if she read the standing orders of the main committee, it clearly says, clearly says that an unresolved question cannot be decided in this committee but must be referred to the House. There are four unresolved questions that have been put to this committee and are unresolved. I have referred them to the House. The, on, the honourable member for Lilly on a point of order. For, Look, I've got, a, no I've got untold chair. patience. Just for order. Yes, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of logic, you cannot have an un unresolved uh, what's the point motion. Of order? Point of law, order is very simple. You can't have an unresolved motion of dissent Look, in the chair. Do I have it's to read the standing orders? It's an oxymoron. For the honourable member for Lilly. I mean, the standing orders are very explicit of this committee. An unresolved question is referred to the House. I call the honourable member for Wentworth. Speaker, the issues before the House are rising. Point of order. The honourable member for Melbourne points on a point of order. Dissent in the chair in any public meeting has to be dealt with before any other matter can be dealt with. You cannot resume discussions of other matters, which are the substantive matters that were before the House, uh, which the House clearly decided would, be, would uh, focus, if there, were, if there was uh, any disagreement, on ma matters substantive to the stem cell um, uh, uh, legislation. It, the, the House did not intend that you would overrule 
700 years of procedural debate in any democratic the member assembly for Melbourne Ports by allowing now, you to the member for say Melbourne that the Senate chair cannot the be issue. decided by a majority the of member for Melbourne Ports will time. resume his seat, he's debating the issue. Can I remind the member... Order, order for the member for Robertson. Can I remind the member for Melbourne Ports that this is not a public meeting, it is the main committee, and we are bound by the, we are bound by the standing orders. The member, the member for Melbourne Ports will resume his seat till I'm finished. We are abiding by the standing orders of the main committee, and I've spelt out the standing orders of the main committee. That's what we're abiding by, the standing orders of the main committee. The Honourable Member for Robertson, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This bill, which we are hoping to debate, is a very important bill. Now, the Re Member for Robertson is debating. What's the point of order? The point of order is that the opposition are clearly restricting debate. We have passed a motion in the that's House. That's not a point of order. We have, well, the Member for Robertson, that's not a point of order. Uh, Mr. Mr Deputy say... Speaker, the point of order is the fact that we have passed a motion in the House which clearly states that the main committee continue debate on the bill regardless of any unresolved question. And I support I your ruling that in that, way. Mr Deputy. The member for Wentworth. Speaker. Member for Wentworth resume. The member for Prospect on Look, the point of order. Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't want to have to keep raising the question, but the fact of the matter is the, the worst unresolved question I believe here tonight is the fact of dissent to the chair. How can you possibly conduct this meeting when a motion of the I'm sorry, has but been the member moved? for Prospect is now debating a, a, a Well, I'm not. I'm just a, asking a for a clear I have ruled, direction. But you haven't ruled. You, you only referred me to the item member four. For Prospect, item you, four you, you can resolve this issue in the, main, in, in the House because that's where it will be resolved. That's where it will be, be resolved. If you want to debate the issue in the, in the House, you can debate the issue in the House. I have resolved that they are, they are unresolved questions and will be resolved in the House. Yeah. Member for Melbourne Points, a, a point of order. Yes, Mr Deputy Speaker. Under what standing order do you say that a matter of dissent? Under what standing order of the main committee do you say dissent in the chair cannot be dealt with by uh, this democratic assembly of uh, people? I would argue to you that this... This dissent ruling, you said this is not a public meeting, that the same democratic procedure is inherent in the standing orders of the main committee that is inherent in any democratic public, public meeting. And you, you simply cannot say that I will not deal with the dissent thing and I will refer it, refer it off to the parliament. The member for Melbourne Ports is now debating the issue. Look, the, the, my reply to it is that the House, the House of Representatives, order please. The House of Representatives has passed a motion and referred it to the committee. And this motion says very clearly in clause 4, the main committee continuing debate on the bill regardless of any unresolved questions. I rely on that. I rely on that. And I also rely on the standing orders of this committee which says an unresolved question must be referred to the House. I call the Honourable Member for Wentworth. The Honourable Member for Wentworth will resume his seat. Uh, which member says? In terms of these sorts of things, is the matter should be resolved point immediately, point of order, rather than waiting for some time for the debate to continue. No, no, this no, issue no. has been is a dissent no. motion. It should be addressed. It's got to go back to the House immediately, rather than rather than continue the debate. That's my understanding. No, of no, no, look, that's that's debating the question. Look, you weren't here, I think, when I said earlier that the, that the the point four of the motion passed by the House of Representatives, the Parliament of Australia says that no, no questions unresolved in this House can obstruct the debate in this House. They will be referred to the House for, for resolution. I call the, the Honourable Member... Sorry, the Honourable Member for Patterson on a point of Mr. order. Mr Speaker, what we're clearly seeing here is a delaying That's tactic. That's not a point of order. Mr. But Mr Speaker, not the point, point, of, order order, is, point, of, point order. of order is that they are continuing to discount your ruling you have read out the point of it's order. It's not a point of order. Not a point of order. I call the honourable member for Wentworth. Speaker, the issues before this house are complex and are of long-term significance. But it is oh, stop it. Order. Order, order, order. The honourable honourable member. I, don't, you have the I, I feel the that I'm entitled to Order. 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 The, the honourable member for Fowler on a point Thank of you, order. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. 
I understand that the, I'm after clarification here. The member for Perth dissented from your ruling, Mr Deputy Speaker. Now, you stated that you were going to refer that matter to the House. Yes. Now, if that is unresolved, that is showing no confidence, Mr Deputy Speaker, in your um, uh, decision, you are still in that uh, chair, and I cannot understand why the matter has not been sent the to the House of Representatives now. The member for Taylor is now debating, now. Now debating the issue. I have ruled. I have ruled on that I issue. Have. Why don't you read it? Order. I have ruled on that issue. The honourable member for Wentworth. Not the member for Wentworth. The honourable member for Wentworth will resume his seat. Honourable member for Wentworth will resume his seat. The, the, uh, accepted a lot of points of order that may have been on the same point. Um, whilst I agree with you that the um, resolution passed by the House is quite am unambiguous, um, my understanding. What's the point of order? Well, my understanding with a dissent. Firstly, I presume we have to follow the correct form, and it must, needs to be handed in in writing. But secondly, it's not a question unresolved about the bill. It is a procedural issue. And, and uh, if I may say, Mr Deputy Speaker, with great respect, I'm not sure that I've heard a dissent motion moved in this— This is debating the issue. I, I will look— well, could, could I just point out that I don't believe that, that— What is the point of order? Well, I'm not sure that— Order. I'm not sure that a dissent motion has previously been moved in the main chamber. And uh, I guess from that point of view, I can't, I can't point to precedent about how it might be handled. But it would be. Well, that's it, debating the issue. What is the point of order? Well, well, personally, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I could say, um, given that we've never had it before, I would, I believe, I, the pun? moved a motion. Order, 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 order. What is the point of order? Well, I, I believe it's a procedural issue. It's not an unresolved well, question. Look, I will resolve. With the I, I will, uh, look, there are two clear issues. No, I will rule on, on the. There are two clear issues that I've already said, and I've said over and over again, although it doesn't seem to be entering any heads at the present time. First of all, the standing orders of this committee is very clear that a resolution cannot be resolved in this committee. It must be referred to the House. The second issue is that the, the the uh, resolution moved and, and carried by the House, the Australian Parliament, clearly says on, 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 on four, the main committee continuing debate on the bill regardless of any unresolved questions. Any unresolved questions. Very clear. Very clear. Very clear. Now, the honourable member for Franklin on a point of order. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Could you inform me who authorised the clock to stop? At nine, 1954, one would assume. I, it, it, I mean, no, I don't want to wish to deprive the honourable member of his time, I agree, but yeah. I would. But the normal procedure the, uh, is that well, once the clock is started, it, no one, but no one interferes with that clock, and I it's still know, on 1954. I cannot answer the questions. Probably in disgust, the honourable member for Wentworth. Speaker, I should say the honourable yeah, member for Perth on a point of order. My point of order is this. One of the unresolved questions on is an unresolved one of the unresolved questions is an unresolved question of the want of confidence that the main committee has in you. you, you the, House look, simply, I, I, the House cannot look, allow you are you are no, making no, a statement. I'm, not I'm, a point of statement. Order. I'm making I'm making a point of order and there are two two aspects of the point of order. The first is that the House can't allow such a resolution to continue ad infinitum. It must deal with the question. It must deal with the question of want of confidence in the chair immediately. That's the first point. Second point, in any event, in Can any event. Member for Perth, show me the, the, the standing order that says that. Any any time a want of any time a want of confidence any time a want of confidence motion is moved in the chair, it is considered by it is considered by the House immediately. It is considered order. by the House immediately. You can't, you can't allow a question of want of confidence to be unresolved for a period of time. That must be dealt with immediately. That's the first point. Second point, in any event, that most serious of any serious procedural motion, just like the other procedural motions which have been the subject of unresolved questions tonight, are not in any event caught by the resolution of the House, which are expressly limited to 
the bill. The most serious of the procedural motions goes to a want of confidence in you. And you are saying to the main committee that this you are happy to have that indefinitely as an unresolved you are now question. You are now debating the issue. You are happy to have that indefinitely as an unresolved question. You are now debating the issue. You can't allow the House. I have the member for you Perth will resume the, his seat. You can't allow the House. The member for Perth will resume his seat. I have heard the point of order. I have heard the point of order. You will resume your seat. Well, you are debating it. You're not. You're not uh, continuing. Well, I have heard the point of order, which is dissent in my ruling. The point of order on the way and manner in which the House needs to deal with an unresolved question about want of confidence in your chairing of this main committee. My first point is that you, you are debating the issue, Member for no, Perth. You are not raising a point of the order. You point are debating. Of, the first aspect of the point of order is that you can't allow the House not to deal with that immediately. The second point is, in any event, that, is, that, that unresolved question is not covered by the resolution passed by the House earlier this evening. The, that resolution is expressly Perth limited. Will resume his seat. You are debating the issue. You are not raising a point of order. You will re resume your seat. You resume your seat. I will rule on the point of order. I will rule on the point of order. Well, when you sit down, I will rule. I will, I will refer you to Standing Order 276. 276. Every question of the committee shall be decided on the voices. And if any member dissents from the result announced by the chair, the question shall be recorded in the minutes as unresolved. Any unresolved question shall be reported to the House and included in a schedule attached to the report of the committee to the House on the bill or the order of the day. Provided that if the question of the committee do now adjourn is unresolved, it shall be deemed to be resolved in the affirmative. Now I have ruled that these, these questions that have been put to the committee are unresolved. I have referred them to the House. Two eighty. Standing order says, except as provided by these standing orders, the same rules relating to the proceedings on bills and for regulating the conduct of business shall be observed in the main committee as in the House itself. The so same the same rules for regulating the conduct of business shall be observed in the main committee as in the House. If a motion for want of confidence was moved in the Speaker or a Deputy Speaker in the House, it is incredulous to argue that that would not be considered by the House immediately. There is an unresolved question as to the want of confidence that the main committee has in you. That must be resolved immediately. It must be resolved immediately. I, I, well, I have ruled, and it will be referred. I have ruled, and it will be referred to the House. You can, you can debate the issue in the House. I call the honourable member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The issues before this House are complex and of long-term significance, and they do not admit of the option to do nothing. On the one hand, if the bill succeeds, the honourable member for Wentworth on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Deputy oh, sorry, Speaker. Sorry, the honourable member for Prospect. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I clearly appreciate and understand Standing Order 276, which you have read out. I again would appeal to the people in the main committee here that 280 is very specific. If a dissent order. in the chair has been moved, it must be acted on. The chair has provided, through that dissent ruling, no confidence to any speech being given in the House tonight. You have no confidence then because the dissent has not been qualified. A vote has not been taken on it. The ruling is there pending has nothing to do with the motion we voted on. I repeat it, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I again refer to you. 276 is specific. 280 says this committee must run in the same as the parliament. You must refer your dissent motion against you to the parliament to be acted on now. And if you've done that, we would have been back up here now. On several occasions explain to members opposite what the rulings are. I would believe that they are probably looking to be uh, to dis suspend the, the, uh, the committee as disruptive. I warn members I will name the lot of them. Member for Wentworth. The issues before this House are complex and of long-term significance, but do not admit of the option to do nothing. If the bill succeeds, uh, it will clearly establish unequivocally that in Australia, Cloning of human cells for the purposes of reproductive or therapeutic purposes will be absolutely prohibited. Member for Wentworth, Upon the honourable member for Prospect is on a point of order. The... Member for Wentworth will resume his seat.
The Honourable Member for Prospect is further on the to the point of order, the Honourable Member is on his chair. Could you please explain to me in the House, I alone have been up here over 22 minutes, how he still has 13 minutes remaining on the clock on his debate. Well, you have called him before I came into the House, and as I said, I've been here 22 minutes. That is, an, uh, that is a problem that was resolved as soon as it was pointed out to the, the House that the clock was not, uh, was not continuing. Uh, it's a bit difficult to say how much time was spent in disruption. Uh, I call the honourable member for Wentworth. Thank you. I am going to be a little bit harsh here in a minute. The honourable member for Lilly on a point of order. I move that the House do now adjourn, Mr. Deputy. Questions speaker. of the House do now adjourn. All that opinion, so please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. It is an unresolved question. I'll refer it to the House. The honourable member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. On the other hand, if the bill fails, then the position in existence before the COAG agreement in April of this year will prevail. That is, that there will be no legislation on a national basis banning cloning in the states of New South Wales, Queensland and Tasmania, and varying regimes in the other states and territories. It is generally accepted by the, both the supporters and opponents of this bill that, uh, before the House that that position is undesirable. Thus, it is accepted by all sides of the bait that some form of legislation is necessary. Hence, to do nothing is no option at all. In my address, Mr Deputy Speaker, I wish to address uh, several issues. The first is the consultation that I have had with my constituents in the federal seat of Wentworth. The second is to address the issues raised by the difficult question of cloning and its scientific nature. The third is embryo stem cell research itself and the benefits that may arise from it. The fourth is adult stem cell research. Finally, the, more, the difficult theological and philosophical question, which is at the heart of the debate, namely, when does human life begin? Then the protections in the bill, and finally, to draw some conclusions, which I hope will advance the debate. Will resume his seat. The member for Fowler, point of order. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, it's quite obvious that the member opposite is completely out of time. He rose on his feet at ten past eight. I have ruled eight. on that issue. I said that the clock was a problem to start with. We cannot resolve it at this particular time. I, I think we need to apologise for that. But I have called the member for Wentworth. Uh, Mr. Order. 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 Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the first thing that I did in relation to my constituency was to hold a public forum at the Wallara Senior Centre in uh, Wallara in my electorate. And I invited Professor Jansen of the Sydney IVF Institute, who is one of the leading scientists in this area, uh, to put the yes case. And I invited Miss Mary the Byrne the member for of, the seat, of the Plunkett Street. The member for Lowe. The member for Lowe. Mr. The member for Wentworth Speaker. will resume his seat. Mr. Speaker. The member for Mr. Wentworth Speaker. will resume his seat. The member for Lowe. No, no, Mr. Speaker, I only arrived here a few minutes ago, and I need, I, and I, I need to ask you. Uh, the reference to um, naming all of us, as in I presume all of us sitting on this side of the House or the, the, the committee, um, in terms of um, you know, the points of order uh, that have been called here in the main committee I tonight. Because, the I, because, to because the I've just arrived and I'm just wondering why I'd be subjected to that anyhow, because I haven't participated in the debate. No, no, I, no, I'm just seeking point, I, I, no, I'm just, I'm just I have seek, the point of order. I'm seeking clarification why, why all of us could potentially be named, um, you know, if, if we interject or call a further point of order. I just want clarification from the chair why you ha oh, because, because I've taken it as a threat that I can't say anything for fear of being named. And I just like clarification. Sorry? I understand your point of order. Yes. The standing orders of the main committee clearly say that if there is disruption, that a member can be referred to the House. Now, I've had disruption yeah. Yeah. right along. Right yeah. right yeah. There's no debate on that. No, 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 well, further question. No, first, Member for yes, a point of order. Further point of order, because I had only arrived in this chamber a few minutes ago, and, and I'm, I'm not sure what took place before. Well, you are I now arrived. on your feet. Sorry? You're now on your feet on a point of order, disrupting the chamber. The well, member for Wentworth on a point of order. Uh, well, taste in my electorate on this particular issue, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I uh, letterbox dropped uh, the suburbs immediately in the area of the Wallara Senior Centre, and I ensure that there were two advertisements in the principal newspapers that circulate in my electorate. The uh, public meeting which I called was well attended, and the debate was very thorough, very thorough and effective. 
The points of view that were put. The member for Wentworth will resume his seat. The member for Lily on a point of order. Trying to resolve these difficult questions, I, I would like to move that the committee advise the House of the unresolved question that is before the chair, that the committee adjourn immediately, and when, when the House resolves the matters, that the committee return. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All other opinion, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. It is an unresolved question. It is an unresolved question. I'll refer. The member for Thank you. The points of view that were put at that uh, meeting were very instructive to me as the local member. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it might be asked on a question of conscience. Why is it that the views of the constituency are relevant in the formation of the opinion of the member as and when he or she votes in the House of Representatives? Well, there are two answers to that in my respectful opinion, Mr Deputy Speaker. The first is that I take the view that I am not, a, strictly speaking, a delegate uh, of uh, the electorate, but rather a representative. But at the same time, in adopting the representative role, that it is important to take into account the views of the constituency. Therefore, I did consider it important to hold a public meeting so that the issues could be aired and that, they could, that I had the capacity and, uh, uh, and opportunity to draw upon the views of people in my electorate, whose views, of course, I respect greatly. At that meeting, Mr Deputy Speaker, there were several speeches, both for and against, and uh, many questions put to those, uh, are those experts who presented the cases on both sides. Of course, the purpose of it was not to obtain a resolution, but rather to inform and to assist the public debate, which has been a very important one and is going on even to this day, Mr Deputy Speaker, in this chamber before you. And, um, there were two speeches, however, which uh, to me were instructive and uh, were of great effect to those who were present. One was by a lady named Skye Banning, who in fact works in my office. She has diabetes and uh, went blind some five years ago from that uh, terrible disease, said to be incurable. She spoke very warmly of the importance of the hope that, this, uh, embryos, that the stem cell research held out for someone like herself. Another one was a man named Adam Johnson, who didn't live in my electorate but uh, did drive a long way to be there because he'd heard of this public debate. He has motor neurone disease. He was a delegate at the Republican Convention. Uh, some tough couple of years ago in Old Parliament House, a person who was very articulate, and he too spoke very warmly of the hope that uh, was, was uh, open to him as a result of the possibilities by stem cell research. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, it wasn't my purpose to achieve any resolution or indeed um, any uh, definition in my own mind at that public meeting of my own views. I earnestly sought, as a Christian myself, the views of local churches including the rabbis, who, uh, who, uh, some of whom live in my area, uh, including Rabbi Allman, who sits on the World Rabbinical Council. I also went and uh, visited Archbishop Jensen, who is a constituent, who has strong views against uh, embryo stem cell research, which are known well. Uh, but in this way, I was able to consult not only the views of the community, but also the views of leading churchmen and uh, the others who had a contribution to make on the issue. Um, finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the process of consultation in my electorate, I uh, door knocked in uh, two suburbs, namely Randwick and Waverley. And I think it is important to put on the record that the impression that I had as a result of that door knocking was this, that amongst uh, most women, and particularly younger women, they were in favour of embry embryo stem cell research, but with strict limitations to ensure that there was no commerciality, no sale or transfer in an open market of embryos, and I believe that this is a very important qualification that they did make. Uh, the male uh, constituents weren't so uh, clear in their views one way or the other in relation to this legislation, but nonetheless there was, in my assessment, a, a, a firm majority. Then, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've had the benefit of reading the Andrews report in this House that was prepared by the committee last year, and uh, that has been of great uh, instructive benefit to me. That then, Mr Speaker, was, Deputy Speaker, was the process that I undertook in consultation with my constituency and the broader electorate in seeking to form my views on the issue of conscience, the important issue of conscience which is before this parliament. Let me now speak about the second matter I mentioned, namely the issue of cloning. I know that there are some in the scientific community, particularly in relation to the issue of therapeutic cloning, that uh, believe that this is an important scientific advance which should be sustained. 
However, I do not accept that view because I take the view that therapeutic cloning is uh, uh, so close to reproductive cloning as to be dangerous and uh, does not admit of any true distinction that would permit a proper program of research of the type that's proposed in this bill. And therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, somatic cell nuclear transfer, which is in effect what is meant by cloning in this context, is properly banned by this legislation, and I strongly support it for that reason. The, second, uh, the, the next issue which I mentioned was uh, embryo stem cell research itself. Of course, the, the formation of the embryo for the purposes outlined in the bill does not involve any, syst any system of therapeutic cloning by somatic cell nuclear transfer or by any other means other than the process uh, in the laboratory, in the IVF laboratory, of the fertilisation of, uh, of the female egg by the spermatozoa. The, the formation of, the, of the, uh, the two gametes, the spermatozoa and the ocletes, in the IVF laboratory. Mr Deputy Speaker, the question therefore is whether or not this, does, this form of research does give rise to any benefit or any limitation which ought to be objected to. In relation to the benefits, of course, the principal benefit is the evolution and the, by the extraction through pipettes of the, uh, uh, the stem cell itself. Not a lot has been said about the stem cells as such. I mean, stem cells were first discovered in uh, rodents in as, far along, as far ago as 1970. Since then, stem cell research has developed quite extensively. But uh, it wasn't until recent years that it was appreciated that the extraordinary ability of stem cells, called uh, pluripotentiality, I think is the word, is to take on the form, the physical form of cells surrounding a host body, whether it be a liver, whether it be brain cells, even, uh, even blood and indeed even bone marrow, so as to uh, grow in a way that will uh, ensure uh, the, uh, as it were, in a sense, the purification of that particular organ or human part. Order. And Mr Deputy Speaker, it's quite clear that um, the extraction of stem cells from embryos by that form of research and the potentiality that it, uh, that it holds out for the broader community as well as the scientific community is extraordinary. It has been described by some as the most important development in medical science uh, since the development uh, uh, in the 1920s of, um, order. of, uh, of uh, the uh, of of processes that uh, have, have, have marked uh, significant advances in, in medical so science. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the real question then is, are there any alternatives to the extraction of stem cells from the embryos? One, propo one proposal, which has uh, had a lot of news recently, is adult stem cell research. I don't wish to go through the details in the Andrews report of the uh, scientific um, aspects of the extraction of adult stem cells uh, by the process of compatibilisation, which are there set out. But I think, in summary, what we can say is that there are two advantages of embryo stem cells, perceived advantages by the scientific community, which do not uh, adhere in adult stem cells. The first is that, uh, generally speaking, the adult stem cell has a shorter shelf life than the embryo stem cell. That, is, that can be significant in some scientific uh, research uh, which, ha which is referred to in that report and in, in other articles. The second is that the embryo stem cell, sorry, the adult stem cell is less flexible. The member's time has expired. No, not possible, not possible under the second one. The house is Order. I'm advised that that The resolution from the House does say, point two, each member speaking for a period not exceeding 20, 20 minutes. Um, I sat through the member for Wentworth's speech. Um, he, would have, he would have spoken, I'm sure, I'm sure less than 10 minutes. Um, so in view of that, I, I move an extension um, of time because I believe he should have the opportunity um, to speak 
um, for, for a period of 20 minutes, as was outlined in the resolution by the House. Order. Yeah. Um, I'm advised that the time for the member's uh, speech has expired. I call the member for Franklin. The question Mr. is that this bill be read a second time. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. What do I a do remarkable this? evening. Society as I know it has changed remarkably over my 61 years. Doesn't seem to be working. Seems to be favouring one side of politics more than the other. <laughs> order, order, order. The, time, the clock is now working, and uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Member for Franklin. Order, order. I'll start again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I may. Society as I know it has changed remarkably over my 61 years. Family structures, the concept of community, medical innovation, telecommunication advances, travel options and educational opportunities. Growing up as a child in Ballarat, Port Augusta and Rainbow, I experienced the impact of various diseases in my, on the community. I name a couple, whooping cough and measles. It impacted not only on myself but my schoolmates. I well remember, as a youngster, the polio epidemic and the way in which medical professionals fought to curb the disease and its cruel impact on families. I well remember, as a youngster in the early 1950s, visiting my father in the Ballarat Base Hospital as he fought for his life as he suffered from pneumonia, a disease in those days that caused many deaths. Medical research in these times was pretty basic, initiated by some amazing Australian scientists and little understood and little heard of by ordinary citizens unless the diseases hit their families and impacted on them. As an overseas traveller in the mid-1960s, I well remember being vaccinated against smallpox and being violently ill from my shot. Due to wonderful medical research and international governmental cooperation, the world is now free of this disease. Like many in this House, I well remember the time when the IVF debate occurred and the accusations and claims and counterclaims that flew from those who supported and those who opposed this medical advance for infertile couples wanting children. A close family friend's son was one of the earliest recipients of a bone marrow transplant to combat his leukaemia. Just over three years ago, my life was saved by medical research when part of my heart failed in its operation. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've been listening with great interest to the many speakers in this debate, speakers on both sides of the political fence and both sides of the ethical issue. A conscience vote is a wonderful thing in the House. We finally get to hear views of people as they speak from the heart or at least one would hope so. Too often in this place, many members trot out in their speeches what is acceptable to their supporters and their party, and not really what the, they themselves feel is right and proper for Australia and its people. Having, to f having the freedom to wander across the field and explore every nook and cranny, and then finally decide on where you want to build is something to be treasured and encouraged. It's a pity that it doesn't happen more often in this House. It's also a pity, Mr Deputy Speaker, that some people in this place just can't help themselves, even when it comes to a debate like this one, a bill that has been a source of great controversy. I would have liked to have seen each and every one of us who are participating in this debate, and it saddens me that not everybody is. I'd like to see the cessation from stereotyping, name-calling, personal abuse and character assassination because of the views they hold. Why not just put forward your own point of view and leave it at that? As a member of this place for 10 years, it's been fascinating to see the reaction of supporters from the opposing views on embryonic stem cell research. We've all been bombarded by emails, faxes, letters, form letters and mail booklets from both sides of the argument. This is somewhat disappointing in my mind, as the people who have contacted me 
have never spoken to me before, never contacted me on any other issue. This worries me, as I'm very sceptical of people with a single issue in mind, whether it's in favour or against the issue. Mr Deputy Speaker, like others in this place, as I say, I've been bombarded. And I'd like to read a couple, <coughs> not just from one side, but from both sides. One I received up here the other day, I think it was Monday, from a lady in Kingston Beach. Dear Mr Quick, I just wanted to let you know I am opposed to using embryos for stem cell research and those embryos that will be discarded after IVF. Not enough has been said of the research using adult stem cells because they are a viable alternative. It seems to me that any legislation that allows the use of embryos produced for whatever initial purpose is opening the door to things we cannot and have not contemplated. Yours sincerely, Jean Richardson. And by looking at her wonderful writing, I would assume she's a little bit older than I am. There's another one on the other side of the fence. Dear Harry, I don't know how you intend to vote on the bill concerning stem cell research, but I thought it might be, be an opportune moment to mention my daughter Amanda, who has suffered from juvenile rheumatoid arthritis since the age of 16 months. The following is over long, and if you use it in your speech, I leave it entirely to you as, you as to which pieces of information that you use. I'm going to read the lot. She has never known what it is to run and play in the manner of ordinary children, and now at the age of 28, there is a real worry for me that I might outlive her. She can barely walk properly, and the likelihood is that a wheelchair will become mandatory in the near future. She has a walking frame and an electric scooter, but the latter cannot be carried around in a car. It goes without saying that I've made many health contributions for drugs, specialists and the type of equipment needed by the severely handicapped. From an early age, she endured drug and chemical treatments that would sorely test most adults. By the age of four, she was taking a prescribed dose of eight disparate tablets a day. This lasted until the medication caused a stomach ulcer. The appropriate drugs for that condition were duly prescribed and she took them in combination with most of the anti-arthritis drugs of the day. In many respects, she's been a guinea pig or a test subject for the medical profession and was an early candidate for the use of methotrexate, an anti-cancer drug of considerable toxicity, which has been found useful in the treatment of arthritis. She endured traction in bed, which closely resembled a medieval rat, and behind it all, constant and severe pain. At the age of 16, Amanda had a hip replacement, which nearly cost her a life, as the surgeon inadvertently nicked a major blood vessel. Further operations followed in the sequence of a replacement knee, the other hip, the other knee and more recently a so shoulder joint. Arthritis also affects the eyes in the form of iritis. My daughter has already had the lens of one eye replaced and she has had, and has had a follow-up laser surgery. I think you will agree that this, that sight is one sense that most people would least likely to lose. Needless to say, she's not very mobile and the first prosthesis caused problems which required invasive surgery and rebuilding of part of her pelvis, which had crumbled. Her surgeon was concerned about yet another general anaesthetic. As is usual, an anaesthetist noted collapsing blood vessels during the last operation. Mercifully, she survived the operation but required six weeks bed rest and is now undergoing Order. rehabilitation. Order. A division has been called for in the House. The proceedings are suspended to enable members to attend the division. The proceedings will resume when the chair of the main committee is resumed at the conclusion of the division or subsequent divisions. The House committee is adjourned. Okay.
Order. The member for Franklin in continuation. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Throughout her trials and tribulations, my daughter has shown great courage. In, in taxing circumstances, she obtained a degree at Monash University. She remains on a cocktail of drugs, including morphine for arthritis and chronic pain. The unpleasant fact remains that this disease has twisted her body, stunted her growth, produced swelling through the use of steroids and reduced her life expectancy, a situation of which she is only too aware. She has osteoporosis at the age of 28 and is probably menopausal. That means she'll be denied children, a matter of sadness for us all. Of late, she has com commented that death would be a more desirable state, a remark which produced a severe reaction in me. I'm not saying she is suicidal. Far from it, for she battles on indomitably. It is unlikely she will ever get married, and increasingly probable that she will have to live with her mother and stepfather in an unhappy setting. It goes on finally to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, her rheumatolo rheuma rheumatologist has told her that stem cell research offers her the best chance of repairing some of the damage done to her bones and joints, but it will not cure twisted fingers and deformed feet. Nevertheless, it is widely regarded as a cure for the disease. On her behalf, I urge you to vote in favour of the bill. Best wishes, Chris Pownell. Anthea Patterson, the lovely lady who owns the Hartsview Vineyard, faxed me. Dear Harry, as, your representative, as our representative in Canberra, I feel it's important to communicate to you how passionately we feel about this issue. That's her and her husband, Bob. I'm, I'm, I was deeply concerned this morning hearing Bob Carr talk about embryos as only the size of a pinprick, as if therefore they weren't real life also justifying killing these precious lives to help those who are sick or suffering from some disease. The Bible makes it abundantly clear in Psalm 139, verses 16 and 17, when David is speaking to God, he says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. In your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Clearly God has given us life and is precious to him. We have no right to take a life no matter how young. Kind regards, Anthea. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said, we've heard from people on all sides of the spectrum. There are many of us here who, for the first time for a long time, are actually talking to each other across party lines, wondering whether we are going to split this bill. There are people talking of abstaining from a vote. There is. Uh, I think there are a band of seven of us on our side, the Labor side, who are, who are contemplating voting no. There are people on the other side, some very dear friends of mine, who are in turmoil. It's not an easy issue. Scientists, uh, some of them are close friends of mine. I admire many of them. We have them on our banknotes. They are remarkable Australians. But I think when you get six of them in a room, you probably get seven different opinions. And on something as contentious as this, it really worries me that we have such a divergence of opinion. We have those who say embryonic stem cell is the way to go. Others who are saying adult stem cell. We read constantly in the newspaper, when you scan the internet, you get 27 versions of the same story. And as a person with a deeply religious belief in life. My late father was a very humble Christian man who gave up butchering to become a lay preacher and then at the ripe old age of 68 took it a divinity degree. And he's been the model of my life yeah. from a young child. Yeah. And when we had the euthanasia debate, I was torn because dad was dying from pancreatic cancer. Uh, as I said, uh, before my life was saved by some very fine medical uh, research. And I stand here today. And every morning I wake up and I thank God that I'm still alive. My mother has one of those hyphenated diseases and I celebrated her 85th birthday in nearly the other week. And uh, I said to her mum, wouldn't it be nice to keep you a little bit longer? But I think your body's wearing out and the good Lord has decided that your days are numbered. And she's happy about that. She's in a nursing home. I guess having a conscience vote means that I make up my mind. I weigh up all the pros and cons. I think of my 26-year-old daughter living in London, my 22-year-old daughter living in Melbourne, and wonder how I would feel if they caught some dreaded disease. Thank God, touch wood, whatever. Uh, 
they are free from disease. But I think if either of them got breast cancer or some other horrible disease that afflict women, how would I feel? Would I change my mind? But I have faith, Mr Deputy Speaker, that many of these things are being resolved. I noticed in the paper today some people were saying we're spending tens of millions of dollars on this when across the uh, <coughs> oceans in places far away people are dying, young people are dying from lack of food, lack of medi medical uh, resources and we in the Western world, wealthy, self-content, are able to fund almost uh, unbelievable sums of money pouring it into research to keep the Western world happy and alive and longer. Uh, I look at some of the doctors uh, who are out working in the Aboriginal communities and I pay tribute to them, and yet I see in other branches of the same medical profession obscenely refiguring people so that they look younger and better and healthier. And I wonder what medical research and all this science is about. There's a wonderful <coughs> piece of scripture that uh, I want to inject and I know there are people on my side who are, declare themselves as humanists and probably poo-hoo some of the things I've said, but it's Harry Quick's version of life. And there's a wonderful uh, verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 that sustained my father through many trials and tribulations and me as well. And it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have faith that somewhere along the line many of these diseases will be cured. Some of them, in, not in my lifetime, I'd like to think that the good Lord will give me another 20 odd years and I'll survive as long as my father who passed away at 87. But to me, Mr Speaker, I'm against cloning. I would like to see the bill split up and I think we get a 100% vote against cloning. But when it comes to embryonic stem cell research, I honestly believe in my mind that it's not the way to go. I think there are other options and to put all your eggs in one basket. I know we've spent millions of dollars setting up this wonderful research centre, but I think talking to the people in the cancer network, I remember for Riverina and I are co-sponsors. We had a daffodil day the other day and we've heard of some remarkable advances in the management and treatment of cancer in all forms and it hasn't involved embryonic stem cell research. I don't think it's the way to go. Now I know that I'm not going to be in the majority. I'll be poo-hooed by people on my side and people on the other side. That doesn't worry me. As I said at the outset, this is a conscience vote. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying what I believe. I have faith in humanity that many of the dreadful things that afflict us, AIDS, and youth suicide, poverty, family dysfunctionality will be cured. Order. A division has been called for in the House. The proceedings are suspended to enable members to attend the division. The proceedings will resume when the chair of the main committee is resumed at the conclusion of the division and subsequent divisions. Well, I'm not on. I've expired. So, hope Theresa knows.
in continuation. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In the last three minutes, when the clock starts working again, uh, I guess basically I'd like to sum up. This is a uh, very controversial issue. I'd like to think that there were 150 of us who have thought long and hard about this, this bill. Uh, I will hold no grudges against my colleagues and those from the other side and how they vote. I'll be interested to see exactly who does speak and who doesn't, and I'd, and I'd like the question as to why and why not. I'd like to think that there are 150 speeches from the heart as mine is tonight. Uh, in the euthanasia debate, my two daughters didn't agree with my point of view, but I said, Sarah and Hannah, this is my conscience, my decision. I'm not going to be swayed. I can honestly say, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I've never been swayed by, by anybody. I'm not that malleable and pliable that uh, I do as I'm told. I do as I think and as I feel and as I know the people in my electorate expect me. I'd like to think that they will admire me for, my, for taking a stand, whether they agree with it or not is another matter. I would urge all members of this place to split the bill so that we can have 100 per cent against cloning and then let's have a, a, a vote on uh, the actual issue of embryonic stem cells. To the scientists who work tirelessly in this field, I say congratulations. I do hope you'll make breakthroughs. To the people who are suffering, uh, may God look after you. Uh, some of you will be cured. I guess the younger ones have more hope more possibility than people my age who are encumbered with disease. I look forward to hearing other speakers in this debate. Uh, I hope and pray that they will speak from their hearts. I would urge all members, when it comes to the vote in the main chamber, the house of this wonderful place that we are all privileged to serve in, that they will cast their vote not with an eye on those who shout loudest and longest, but from their hearts, praying and hoping that the decisions they take will have an impact on not only the people in their electorate, but for all Australians. And uh, I thank those who uh, do speak. And uh, with those words, Madam Deputy Chair, I uh, thank the House for their patience. It's been a rather tumultuous evening Lots of things have been said, and I look forward to hearing other members speak in this place on this very controversial but essential bill. Thank you. The question is that the bill be read a second time. I call the honourable member for Patterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise tonight to speak to the research involving embryos and prohibition of human cloning bill 2002. I think that it's important right from the start that we understand what this bill is about. This bill is an act to regulate certain activities involving the use of human embryos to prohibit human cloning and other unacceptable practices associated with reproductive technology and for related purposes. Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Chair, we don't have any member of the opposition. We don't have we don't to. Need we don't need it. Oh. Madam Deputy Chair, the, um, this bill is an exercise in the mind and it's a torment for many people who are debating this bill. Some will stand here debating this bill on religious grounds, ethical grounds and other considerations important to them. For this bill has been put to us as a conscience vote, to vote as we see fit in line with our conscience. The one thing that I would urge all of my colleagues to consider is that we allow the splitting of this bill so that we can determine and decide, and I, from everyone I've spoken to, there is unanimous support to vote down allowing human cloning of any sort. And then the main issue in this bill, which is the embryonic stem cell um, part of using that, will be debated and be voted on its individual merits. Can I say from the outset that I respect every individual's opinion in here, no matter what it may be. But I do take objections to those who claim 
that those with a moral fibre seek to inflict moral standards upon others. We need to go to the very beginning and understanding where does life actually begin. Life begins when a living sperm fertilises a living ovum. They're not dead sperm, they're not dead ovum. So to have a point in life some five days on where people <coughs> consider that's where life begins is quite wrong. And that's the textbook version. All of the embryology textbooks confirm that in fact all human life begins at fertilisation. So with the formation of that individual human being where the DNA is typecast at that point in time, that is a real human life. Destruction of that human right life, for whatever reason, should never, ever be considered. <laughs> At that point, as I said, DNA is formed, and with DNA we have a distinct human structure with a set gene pattern here in life. To sit there and purposely try to destroy that life is really testing on human beings. There is no other way of applying conscience to it. What I've tried to do in this whole debate is hold an open mind, looking for answers, and I've listened to the experts. I'm not a scientist, and I've got to say, neither are most of my colleagues, but I respect the view that they've all gone in search of answers. We've had briefings from people like Professor Michael Good, who's the director of the Queensland Institute of Medical Research, head of the Cooperative Research Centre for Vaccine Technology, head of Comprehensive Cancer Research Centre, from Dr Peter Silburn, who's a neurologist, an adjunct professor, human movement studies, molecular neurobiology, Griffiths University and Faculty of Health, Queensland University of Technology, senior lecturer, Department of Medicine, University of Queensland president, Parkinson Society Queensland vice president, Movement Disorder Society of Australia, Professor Alan Trounson, who's the chief executive officer of the new National Stem Cell Centre, former director of Monash University of Reproduction and Development, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Paediatrics, Monash University. We've had lectures from Professor Bob Williamson, Director of Murdoch Research Institute, Melbourne, uh, the President of the Association of Australian Medical Research Institutes. And can I say, when I hear of people and I hear their discussion and debate, all eminently qualified, and we have conflicting views between the country's gaitists on whether embryonic stem cells research is actually required it leaves a poor bunny like me in a very, very dangerous state. Do I believe one set of scientists or do I believe, do I believe another set of scientists? And I've got to say to you that after listening to all of these scientists, I am convinced of one thing, and that is that all of these gentlemen deserve our respect as they all have a passion to cure the sick. They all have a passion to cure the sick. So when I'm confused by scientists taking a stance on each side, I suppose the next consideration that we need to make is that of medical ethics. And if we look at the basic principles of medical research and we think about the Hippocratic Oath and to, uh, to look at some of the parts of that that have been put down in UNESCO's Universal Declaration on Human Genome and Human Rights 1997 and the World Medical Association Declaration of Helsinki 2000, and a couple of the key points in that are, number one, they must respect the dignity and integrity of the human research subject. Two, it must not result in death or disabling injury. Three, it must put the well-being of human subject before the interests of science and society. And four, must be preceded by careful and rigorous assessment of the risks and burdens in comparison with foreseeable benefits to subjects or others. In other words, to carry out destructive embryo research goes against the medical ethics as laid down in those conventions. And I only need to look at the reporting to human cloning the stand by the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs 2001. And as I said, I've been to a briefing with Professor Trounson, but I'd like to quote from the minority report and it said that, and I quote, that Professor Trounson asserted there is no need to use any more embryos to create embryonic stem cells. This was supported by Mr Robert Klupax, the General Manager and CEO of ES Cell International Proprietary Limited. And they said, and I quote, we now have grown six cell lines within our research laboratories. 
The commercial reality is that it is very unlikely we will ever have to go back to another embryo source again to grow a new line. Our position is that we do not think we will ever have to go back to derive another embryonic stem cell line. Madam Chair, what I would put to you is this report was done in 2001, not much over 12 months ago, and here it is 12 months down the track and we're wanting to go down a different path. You can see why I'm confused. What we also need to look at the fact, and which has been overridden a lot of this, is some of the expert research on adult stem cells. I read in The Australian on the 21st of June of this year an article by John Kerrin and Deborah Hope about Catherine Ver Verfaili of the University of Minnesota, who has led a team which has isolated rat and human adult bar bone marrow stem cells which can differentiate into a wide range of cells and tissue types. In an article published in Nature, it raised the prospect that adult cells have significant advantage over embryonic stem cells with less cancer potential. And in supporting that, a letter by Dr David A. Prentice of Indiana State University, where he's a professor of life scientists, has clearly pointed out the differences between the relative performance of stem cells derived from human embryos and those derived from the adult body or umbilical cord blood. He has clearly stated, and I'm not a scientist so I need to relate to these people, that embryonic stem cells have not yet produced a single clinical treatment. There are few and limited successes in animal models and the problems of immune rejection, tumour formation and genomic instability continue to be unresolved. And that's a quote from a letter of the 20th of August from Dr David Prentice. And further, he says, by contrast, and this is the most important thing, by contrast, Adult stem cells have proven successful in laboratory culture and animal models. They are already being used in a wide range of clinical treatments. I'm not against research. I'm not against saving people's lives or curing diseases. I am against the destruction of human life. The other thing that uh, has happened in this whole argument is there's been great tugging at the emotions of the people involved in the debate. We've seen Christopher Reeve, Superman, who played the role of Superman, wheeled out in a wheelchair and said, unless you support this, I will never walk again. And that is part of the problem. And also there's been a video showing that uh, a rat uh, cured uh, um, by using embryonic stem cells. And uh, this Dr David Prentice says that uh, whilst that was a, a video that was shown, it's actually not been published yet. And the stem cells used for that treatment were not embryonic stem cells, but germ cells delivered from a nine-week-old foetus. Now, today it is going down the track of stem cell research. When do we ask for the next line in the sand movement to allow people to use embryos? Not just embryos of up to five days, but up to 14 days, then 21 days. At what point in life do we stop pushing the barrow wanting to take life. As I said, and my good friend Alan Cadman, member for uh, the Hills is in here, and he has said quite clearly in, in many of the discussions, like I, that life begins at conception. So when I look at all the evidence provided, and as I, I went through some of the other stuff from Pop Professor Bob Williamson, who I, I quoted his credentials earlier on, he said that embryo stem cells have two great advantages. They grow rapidly and easily in the test tube and they can form into any tissue in the body. However, in his documentation he says they have one great disadvantage and that is that they may provoke immune rejection because they are foreign to the recipient and importantly, the growth at times at this stage cannot be controlled. So what we have here is a potential that by developing these stem cells up, we may be creating further problems. He also says, and to his credit, that adult stem cells can be obtained from any tissue and they have three distinct advantages at the moment. Sorry, he says they have three distinct disadvantages at the moment. And that is that they prefer to give cells for tissues from which they're obtained, they're hard to grow and you have to take them from a patient. Well, that's, that, that's very true. But what needs to be understood in this is, as I said quite clearly, for embryonic stem cell, 
you've got to destroy a life. As we go through further and further and start to discuss the advantages, the disadvantages and try to take the emotion out of it, and that's what I've tried to do in all of this debate, is that there are many unsubstantiated claims in the success of embryonic stem cell research. As I said, there's been no current clinical treatments that have proven successful. There have been very few and limited successes in animal models. It's difficult to obtain pure cultures in the dish. It's difficult to establish and maintain the cells. There is the problem of immune rejection, potential for tumour formation and the genomic instability. However, when we look at adult stem cells, and they are proven, with a long way to go, they are proven, and it's proven that they have the ability to generate virtually all adult tissues. They can multiply almost indefinitely, providing numbers of sufficient for clinical treatments. They've proven successful in laboratory culture. They've proven successful in animal models of disease. They've proven successful in current clinical treatments. They have the ability to home in on damage. They avoid problems with tumour formation. They avoid problems with transplant rejection. And most importantly, they avoid the ethical quandary. What I can say is as we go down this road, we need to make a clear-cut decision. And that decision has to be based on the fact of when we take cells from a child or from the blood cord or from the adult, we do it with permission. If we take the cells from an embryonic stem cell, we're taking life away without permission. Sure, some other person may give permission, but the person or the individual or the human, however your interpretation is, is life, does not give permission. The other thing that I have to question is whether the development of stem cell research, embryonic stem cell research, can or may lead to genetic modification of a human being. What I find surprising in this whole debate is that over the years we've heard a lot of debate and a lot of disappointment about genetic, genetically modified foods. But here when we seek, by introducing foreign DNA, foreign genetic structure into a human being to grow, in essence we are starting down the track of changing the genetic structure of that human being, no matter how small. And what will be the ramifications of that long term down the track? We don't know. As I said, there are many qualified scientists, but they can't guarantee us that there will be no problems down the track. The other thing that concerns me is this whole debate seems to be driven by big business. I don't have a problem with people making money, but I do have problems out of people making money out of an emotional roller coaster where they try to deliver hope and quite often fail but go for the massive dollars. And I hear the threat from, from some of my colleagues, which I find disturbing, and that is that uh, if we don't allow this here, this research will go offshore, money will go offshore, intellectual property will go offshore, but can I say to you, our clear conscience will stay here. We have to make a decision that our values are not for sale at any price. I know people who have children delivered by the gift program. And how do you say to those children that you allow their potential brother or sister, because that cell is a potential brother or sister, to be experimented on? But I also know that it's not easy to say to those that are sick and those that need treatment and those that need hope that we would discount that. So in light of all of these arguments, both for and against, I make my decision on this bill based on my ethical beliefs driven by a strong commitment to my God. And I'd refer you to Psalm 139, 13 to 16, which in summary says, the unborn are known and loved by God. I ask this parliament to consider splitting of the bill so I can personally vote on the banning of human cloning. And then I can use my conscience to vote against the use of embry embryonic stem cells. I urge all members to allow this so each and every one of us can have a true conscience vote. 
Order. The question is that this bill be narrowed a second time. The honourable member for Lingiari. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm pleased to be able to have the opportunity to speak on this legislation uh, because it provides us an opportunity for both a un an important and quite a unique debate. And while I'm very glad that both uh, major parties have allowed a conscience vote on this bill, uh, I would hope that every member of this House uses his conscience in identifying with a political group and consciously expresses this, knowing full well what this means each time they vote, not just on this occasion. The bill that's before us deals with important ethical issues and is the result of a great deal of debate in many forums. The House Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs considered the issue of human embryo research and human cloning for two years before it handed down its report in August of last year. The issue has been debated at COAG party forums and extensively in the media. The NH and MRC has taken draft legislation to public forums so that every Australian has had the opportunity to have their say on the issue. Much of the debate in this House so far has been concerned with what this legislation allows. However, it's important to note what this legislation prohibits. The, prohibit, prohib the prohibitions that this bill levies absolutely refute arguments that this bill is a thin end of the wedge or that it would set us upon a slippery slope to moral blindness. The prohibitions in the legislation show that this House, as representative of the people of Australia, is capable of making complex moral decisions. The legislat legislation prohibits the creation, importation, exportation of human embryo clones. It prohibits cloning human embryos by either embryo splitting or by somatic cell, cell transfer, and it provides large penalties for those acts. The bill enables NH the HHMRC Embryo Licensing Committee, whose function will be to licence and assess research activities involving the use of excess embryos from uh, um, assisted reproductive technologies. The prohibitions in this bill, particularly the prohibition of human cloning, make some fairly substantial moral decisions and show that this House is indeed capable, indeed the Parliament is capable, of making difficult ethical decisions. The controversial elements of the bill pertain to the use of surplus embryos created as a result of assistant reproductive technologies. This bill allows excess embryos uh, from these technologies created before 5 April 2002 to be used in scientific research, but it prohibits research on embryos created after the date. The bill also establishes a scheme to licence, assess and enforce standards on research activities involving the use of excess uh, reproduct assisted reproductive technologies, the embryos created by through that process. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as you'll observe during the, Mr. Chairman, as you will observe during the course of the debate, the issue this is an issue that ignites great passion, both here in this chamber and in the community. And we'd be foolish not to accept that the issue of whether to use excess embryos for research is extremely difficult and it's one of, great eth one of ethics and moral belief. The greatest ethical challenges present themselves, it seems, at the beginning and at the end of life. However, I believe the parliament is capable of making the right decision. The debate has again made clear to me the very complex nature of biomedical ethics and that's why I strongly support the Leader of the Opposition's proposal for an Australian Bioethics Commission. This Commission will exist not to defer the responsibility of making ethical decisions from this House to a statutory body, but to advise the government on these issues. An Australian Bioethics Committee would provide a forum in which this nation could discuss detailed ethical and scientific questions rigorously. It would enrich the debate on these issues, which I suspect are only to become more difficult and more scientifically complex into the future. We should not defer the responsibility to another forum, but we do need another forum to inform the debate so that the whole of this nation can participate in it. Ethics and the underlying values that support them are not something that we as a nation should shy away from. 
We are only in danger of losing our values if we do not have a clear idea of what they are. Now, Mr Deputy, Mr Chairman, it took me a long while to make up my own mind about what I would do in this legislation. But I have taken the decision that I will support the bill. But I haven't taken that decision lightly. It was after a great deal of thought and quite careful deliberation over the arguments for and against, and I might say, having listened to the debate uh, in the parliament thus far, that I came to my decision. I am concerned, though, Mr Chairman, uh, that this debate is in this chamber and not in the, main, not in the, not in the House of Representatives. I think that the public have a right to listen to this debate because it will be, it is probably the most contentious issue that this parliament will debate during this course, during this uh, present parliament. And it is, will be, I suspect, the only issue on which there is a conscience vote. So I am disturbed that we have got uh, a situation uh, where the government, using its numbers in the House of Representatives, has moved this matter to this chamber to be debated in this place effectively behind closed doors. Because whilst it is true that the debate will be reported in the Hansard, if it had been in the main chamber, the debate would have been monitored by the media and if it was on this evening, it would have been broadcast. Now I believe the citizens, all citizens of Australia, who have an interest in this debate, have a right to understand and know what is going on in the parliament. And it seems to me that uh, um, by moving the debate into this chamber, what, this, what the government has done through the leader of government business has fatally, I think, sold short the interests of the Australian community in relation to this issue. We can talk amongst ourselves, as we do in this chamber, arguing that uh, one side of the argument or the other, knowing that people on both sides of the chamber are going to share, view, share a common view, whether it's for or against. But in the wider community, no one will know. No one will know unless someone takes the effort, the time and the trouble, to make sure that the debates in this chamber, in this particular chamber, in this main committee, are being monitored and are then the committee are being informed of them. I suspect this will not be the case. And this evening we saw the farce of it all when a non-contentious piece of legislation to deal with veterans' entitlements sought, was sought to be referred to this main committee in an effort to allow us to debate this subject, this very important ethical subject, to debate, to debate this bill in the main house. Unfortunately and sadly, the government refused to allow that referral and as a matter of uh, a fact, we are now going to debate out this legislation in this chamber and ultimately we'll have a vote in the other place. The record there will report will record who voted for what, but apart from the vote, the content of the deliberations will, I fear, go unheard. But as I want to make it very clear that I have consciously considered all sides, well, both sides of this debate and many of the issues, and I'm not an expert, I'm not an expert on ethics or theology or on medicine or science, but I do, I think, have uh, the ability to make decisions based on what I think are judgments soundly based on my own moral principles and my own ethical standards. And I base my decision on the principle of the value of every human life. And I think that the answer to the questions that this bill puts must be informed by the value that we place in human life. Life that is, and dare I say, life that will be. It is a larger but not altogether different question from the question of what we do with the excess embryos that are created through the assisted reproductive technologies. This bill asks us to weigh up the value of banning research on embryos that would otherwise be destroyed against the value of the treatments and therapies that this research may yield. 
alleviating pain and suffering for some of the most debilitating diseases. The scientific and technical arguments have already been discussed in this chamber or in the, in the, in, during the course of this debate, not in this chamber, and I will not go over them here. Suffice to say that the stem cell research covers hope, offers hope for the development of a range of treatments ranging from those commonly referred to in the context of this discussion, from treatments of neurodegenerative diseases, including MS, motor neuron disease and Parkinson's disease, uh, and to congenital and other diseases. Specifically, embryonic, uh, embryonic stem cells have the capacity to differentiate into any other type of cell in the body. Adult stem cells, in contrast, have only a limited potential for differentiation, although recent research shows that some adult stem cells may have the ability to revert or to be passives to levels of lesser differentiation. While the potential for embryonic stem cell research is immediately greater than that from adult stem cell research, I am sceptical that stem cell research in general will be the panacea that some have made it out to be. I do wonder whether all the treatments and cures for diseases that have been touted about this place in the last week will be developed in the future as a direct result of embryonic stem cell research. However, this in itself is no reason to stop embryonic stem cell research. I am also unconvinced that gene therapy and therapies developed through stem cell research will not have unforeseen or adverse effects sometime down in the future. There are numerous examples of where scientists have not fully understood the ramifications of their work, resulting in disastrous consequences. And I'm sure that they're uh, understood by many in the chamber. Well, the few that are here. Um, and I'm thinking, firstly, one example, the outbreak of CJD in Europe has been attributed to the use of animal cadavers as a resource of protein in feedlots. This may have been done with the best of intentions by scientists who thought that they knew what they were doing. But the consequences for many lives were disastrous. And a very simple analogy. Scientists introduced the cane toad in an effort to eliminate insects from the cane fields of North Queensland. Now, of course, these aren't analogous. But what they demonstrate is that science wanted to produce one outcome and got an unintended, unintended consequence as a result. And a result in the case of cane toads, which has had disastrous impacts upon ecosystems right throughout northern Australia. It would therefore be churlish to think that in this new area of stem cell research, that there, where the potential benefits are so great, that there may not be, down the line, some unforeseen consequences. Now, many people in the, in the parliament, in this chamber, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, in the House, let me be very clear about it, as opposed to this particular chamber, including the members for Gwida and Warringah, have argued that this bill should be rejected because of all life is sacred. The member for Warringah argued that it is imperative to protect the embryo because it cannot protect itself. But I fear that they, have, uh, they see only the ethical debate and may just have forgotten the ethics. And I won't uh, labour the point, but there are many people in Australia and around the world who uh, suffer needlessly and die from preventable diseases. I, I believe that the views of many people that oppose this bill are in themselves inherently contradictory. The member for Sturt, for example, had some very interesting views in this matter. In his speech to the Parliament of the Bill, he said, quote, to me, scientifically, a one-cell embryo has every aspect that is required to form a human being that I have or that you have, end quote. However, he had no difficulty with the fact that the excess embryos created through assisted reproductive technology will ultimately die. He claims that, quote, there is a profound moral difference between killing and letting die, end quote. He went on to say, quote, there is vast differences between treating these, those embryos with the respect and using them for research purposes to create human embryonic stem cell lines that destroy and kill the embryo in the process, end quote. Now, there is a question which has been raised indeed by the previous speaker as to when does an embryo become a person? If we accept that embryos in every way human, as the previous speaker said, Surely and logically, it is morally repugnant to create embryos that will ultimately die. If we were to adopt this position, we would have to ban all forms of assisted reproductive technology that are currently being used. 
to accept the position that a one-cell embryo is human, to accept that embryos will be destroyed in the process of this technology, at the reproductive technology, at the same time as supporting it, is to tacitly, in my view, condone euthanasia. It is to say that embryos destroyed in the process of assisted reproductive technology are human beings and are expendable. It is to say that the death of many human beings is justifiable by the creation of just a very few. This argument to me is untenable, and I would have thought puts the proponents of it in a moral dilemma. I have not heard anyone in this House argue that we should ban assisted reproductive technologies and deny some couples the ultimate joy of parenthood. While this is a moral and to some a religious debate, it is not a debate that is resolved by religion, but one that exists within the religious traditions. The member for Flinders succinctly outlined the debate that continues within the Catholic tradition. Now, I'm not going to repeat it uh, here because the, the time won't permit, but he gives a very good, I think, uh, um, analysis of the Catholic tradition changing as a result of a decision made by Pope Leo XIII in 1887, which effectively changed Catholic doctrine. My judgment in this matter comes down to the real question that this bill is asking us. The member for Aston crystallised the question thus. He said, quote, we are not being asked to determine the fate of those embryos. Whatever we decide, their fate is to be destroyed. We are only asked to determine how they should be destroyed, as part of the research program to benefit future generations or simply as discarded waste product, end quote. Now, it seems to me, Mr Deputy Speaker, those people who would oppose this uh, legislation on the basis that we should not use these excess embryos uh, for research and using these theological and ethical arguments which they have been wont to use, I think, are contradicting themselves. Because it seems to me, again, that you can't have it both ways. You either sustain all embryos or you don't. And if uh, you are going to allow them to die, as has been said by others, then it seems to me the moral dilemma is not so great. You tacitly euthanise by exposing these cells that they just wither, or do you intervene? Now, my view is that humankind demands that we intervene. That we maximise the opportunities that would result from this research, from the exploitation of a very few, a very small number of these excess embryos, of the thousands, tens of, tens of thousands of excess embryos that exist, and tens of thousands of excess embryos that will ultimately wither. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> I was uh, going to illustrate in some detail the contradiction between the views of those who support this, who oppose this legislation uh, and where they stand in the support of other human life. And I was going to retail the detail of how on the one hand we have such um, the moral strength of their argument is pinned on this issue of value of human life, yet we cannot bring ourselves as a nation to deal properly with the human lives that are being lost every day by poor health in the Indigenous community of Australia. Now, I would have thought there is some logic in the view that if you accept the propositions that they put, we'd be, we'd be doing a lot more about the suffering both here in Australia and, I might say, in other parts of the world. To those who would argue for passion and emotion to be taken out of this debate, I would quote the member for Fremantle. She said, and I quote, this debate is about our common human feelings and there have to be emotions in these debates, otherwise we are simply siphons and what we should, what we should hand the debate over to a, and, and we should hand the debate over to a computer. Mr Chairman, I have much, after much thought, I have decided to support this legislation. Fundamentally because, in my view, that if these embryos are to be destroyed in any event, I believe that you have an obligation to use them to benefit the living. This is not the thin end of the wedge. The parliament has shown its time after time. And I believe that we will be, we will, we will be demonstrated again through this debate 
that we are capable of making the tough moral decisions, and I believe this parliament will continue to make the tough moral decisions as they reflect the wider community's view. But I go back to say that this debate should be in the main chamber. I understand it suits the convenience of the committee if the debate is adjourned and the assumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The Honourable Member for Hinkler. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the main chamber be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Lingiari. Do you second the motion? I do. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The main committee stands adjourned until 4pm tomorrow. <laughs>